Hello, and welcome to Queen of the Ring, the podcast that wants to talk to you all about wrestling. My name is Alexa. I want to give a quick content warning for this series about conversations about child sexual abuse, physical and verbal abuse, sexual assault, and ending one's own life. If you're not in a place to listen to something like that, I completely understand. For today's episode, I want to talk about somebody very special to many wrestling fans, Luna Vachon. By using mere words to describe my existence in the wrestling world is like using a screwdriver to cut roast beef. You see, like a woman with good bones, real jewels, and old money knows her place in society. I know my place in the squared circle. This is a very big undertaking as she is beloved by so many all across the world and she has such an important place within women's wrestling and wrestling history in general, I think. Many of the people that I cover matter a lot to me and their stories touch me in a very deep way and Luna is no exception. I want to do right by her as much as possible, and I hope I can. Women wrestlers help us as viewers break out of traditional roles of society, and we can live vicariously through their power and their passion. And Luna's power was palpable. This ludicrously silly, passionate, wrenching, and sweet industry is only intensified by its feminine representations in whatever form that could take. In spite of Luna's hugely massive talent and birthright, her career wasn't exalted because of the men that were in positions of power around her. Her version of femininity didn't uphold the messages that they wanted to send and spread, and they didn't see any value in what she had to offer. But fans always did, and they continue to. While big corporations she was a part of continue to deny her importance, fans still celebrate her continuously and never-ending online. There's a lot to Luna's story, and to get through it all, I'm hoping I can do this in a little bit more than two parts, maybe. Or hopefully two. With today's episode, I hope to talk about the beginning of Luna's life and her family's history and what got her into wrestling. Luna Vachon was born Gertrude Elizabeth Wilkerson on January 12, 1962, in Atlanta, Georgia. The Wilkerson family was made up of Gertrude, her father Charles, and her mother Rebecca, who went by Van. They all lived together in a trailer park in Chambly, about 35 minutes outside of Atlanta, where her dad owned and ran a motel. Gertrude lived in this trailer park with her family for about three and a half years, but things were about to change. The professional wrestler Paul the Butcher Vachon tells his story of the night of December 18, 1966, on the Vice television show Dark Side of the Ring. While traveling to do a show in Atlanta, Paul checked into the Wilkerson's motel, and after his late-night bout, he returned to his room to rest before moving on to another city the next day. He was awakened in a deep sleep by what sounded like a gunshot, and according to him, he jumped up, opened his door, looked around, did not see or hear anything suspicious, so he decided to go back to sleep. As the sun started to break through his hotel room curtains, Paul was woken again by a knock at his door, and when he opened it, he was met by a sobbing woman standing in the doorway. She said that she and her husband owned this motel, and she had just discovered him dead in his office. He had shot himself. 
Paul walked her to the lobby area, and when they arrived, she introduced him to her three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Gertrude. Shortly after this, Gertrude's mother, Van, married Paul. When a door closes, a window opens. Through this new existence and new family, our Luna was introduced to wrestling. Legacy has a way of creating intention out of almost thin air. Losing one father and gaining another, Gertrude's unknown impetus was set. The urge to be a part of something larger is so alluring, and carrying on the traditions of one's family is so much more than affirming. Luna would come to view wrestling like a gene she inherited, like it was a deep biological reaction. And wrestling became fused with her identity. It became a limb that she carried, a part of her body and a part of her soul. Because of these incredibly deep, deep roots, when her extended wrestling family broke faith with her, it ended up leaving an incredibly deep, open wound. But still, our Gertrude's new family was wrestling royalty in Canada. But before wrestling placed this stranglehold on the Vachon family, they were dairy farmers by trade. And originally from Montreal, the Vachons spoke French in their home. In his book, Wrestling with Life, Paul Vachon says he didn't learn English until he was 13, and his French Catholic family took their religion seriously. All of their children attended Catholic school, and Paul was even an altar boy at one time. But the most Catholic thing, however, could be the fact that there were 13 of the Vachon children. This large family of 15 altogether lived directly off of Vermont Highway 105, of which Paul writes, quote, Built onto the side of a green mountain, the house was a hundred years old in the 1940s, and that's when it became our family farmhouse. Behind it, it was 200 acres of forest covering a 1,500-foot high mountain. Amazingly, out of the 13 Vachon siblings, with this as their backdrop, three would become wrestlers. Maurice, the eldest of this sprawling trio, brought the sport to the family through a series of events all centered around an apple barrel, which just to a person that's lived mostly in the 21st century sounds like a mandatory story that you would hear about a family living in the 1940s in Montreal. I don't know. But his younger brother, Paul, Luna's dad, was playing with an apple barrel down the street from their house when a bunch of these neighborhood toughs stole it from him, and they sent Paul home barrelless and bleeding. Maurice, who would become known as Mad Dog and raised homing pigeons in their family's backyard as a child, would beat up anybody who picked on his siblings. And not only did he get that barrel back for Paul, he went to those boys and he beat the shit out of them. And after their father came out and started laughing at him, he also beat the shit out of their father. He was only 13 years old when this happened. I love that story. (laughs) When witnessing this display of aggression... (laughs) Their father, Ferdinand, encouraged Maurice to get into boxing as a way to take out his anger. And standing at only 5'7", Maurice somehow exuded a visceral strength that made him look colossal. From the boxing ring, Maurice was introduced to a wrestling coach, and he wrestled in high school, going on to have a successful amateur career. Years later, he was a part of the 1948 London Olympics, and that was the first since the end of World War II, which was a big deal. When his amateur work turned professional, he and his iconic mad dog growl became famous the world over. Later in life, after he was struck in a hit and run by a car, Maurice's leg had to be amputated. And while he was recovering in the hospital, he received more than 40,000 letters, phone calls, messages of support, and more. That's how adoring the fans were. Gertrude's quote-unquote new father, I don't like that, but Paul, the butcher of Ashan, was the seventh of the, ch- of the 13th children. And of course, having 
been the one that was being protected by his older brother Maurice the whole time, Paul wanted to follow in Maurice's footsteps. He also pursued a wrestling, and he went on to win a silver medal in a provincial amateur wrestling championship in Montreal, and he represented the province of Quebec. After winning this medal, he returned to his hometown, and his father, Ferdinand, became a catalyst for a few of the wrestling prospects that the Vachon boys had. One day, while Ferdinand was at his local bar, he noticed an opportunity for his son, Paul. A man was putting up posters for a wrestling event taking place just that week down the road. The man that Ferdinand introduced himself was named Don Van Fleet, and he was this nostalgic carny who caravanned around the country, hauling a wrestling ring behind him. And we know wrestling's roots emanate from many different places and a few different countries. There's different styles, different cultures. And, but part of its modern interpretation started in the circus. Paul claims that Van Fleet basically witnessed the birth of modern wrestling. And after Ferdinand approached Van Fleet and discussed Paul's accolades, Ferdinand was told to bring Paul by the show. And this permanently connects the Vachans with modern wrestling's genesis. Once Paul got his feet underneath him as a wrestler, he and Maurice would become one of the most successful and most hated tag teams in history. The third of the Vachans to get into wrestling is Gertrude's aunt, Vivian Vachon. She was the baby of the family and the only of the 13 children to be born in a hospital. 13 years her senior, Paul was named her godfather at her birth. And by the time Vivian was five years old, Paul and Maurice were already wrestling, and Paul would bring her along to most of his matches. As she got older, Vivian hitched her wagon to her brothers and decided she wanted to become a wrestler herself. The boys sent her to the only person they knew that churned out lady wrestlers, and that was the fabulous moolah. Vivian would go on to be considered one of the best women wrestlers in history, and she starred in a movie called The Wrestling Queen that also featured her two brothers. I am 21 years old. I am the youngest of 13 children. Two of my eight brothers are internationally famous athletes, Maurice Mad Dog Vachon and Paul the Butcher Vachon. My name is Vivian. I also wrestle. The feature provides an honest look into the Vachon family, while not breaking kayfabe. These three people were not aware of it, but they were going to be the reason that little Gertrude, whom her family called Trudy, would be propelled down these same roads that they walked. Her uncle, father, and aunt became some of the best villains in wrestling history. Because the binaries of good and evil serve a very important purpose— that permeates the participants of storytelling, it, that it can be in drama and in wrestling. That contrast between the goodness of that baby-faced hero can't be really actually realized without that bubbling villainy that exudes from a heel. Throughout history, humans tell stories that incorporate this divergence, you know, like biblically, philosophically, and through mythology and folklore— the Vajan's noble place in wrestling was pickled in villainy. Trudy would take elements of all of these villainous attributes and she would create her own Frankenstein. The wrestler McFoley referred to the Vajan family as odd in a beautiful type of way. Trudy grew up on the road with her family, touring the wrestling territories in the U.S. and Canada, she would keep busy by doing her Aunt Vivian's hair, putting her curlers in, cleaning up her dressing room, and watching her do her makeup. And all she wanted to do was be like her Aunt Vivian. In his book, Paul revealed that around this time, Trudy was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And if that's true, it's a very young age, and I can only imagine how confusing that would be. Her struggles with mental illness seemed to feed the pieces of a character that she would create in the future, though, and it would come to represent these different pieces of Trudy. 
Throughout the 60s and 70s, when Trudy wasn't with her family on the road, she stayed with her parents, and they owned a wrestling promotion company in Montreal. Life had a way of moving very fast with six siblings, and the Vachons were always very busy. And often when they were at home, wrestlers would stay in their house, cycling in and out. And, you know, while people are rotating infinitely, using your home as an inn, it seems very difficult and seems like you'd be forced to sacrifice a lot. And Trudy later divulged that beyond, way beyond those sacrifices, that at around this time, more than one of these men that occupied her home abused her, sexually assaulted her, and took advantage of her. Which is just horrifying to have to endure something like that throughout your childhood at different moments. But as life continued to move forward, brought into this family of wrestling stars, Gertrude, just like her Aunt Vivian, was drawn to wrestling almost preternaturally because of her family's relationship with it. The family unsuccessfully tried to dissuade Trudy from becoming a wrestler. After witnessing what wrestling was capable after three, 30 years in the business, three years, no, 30 years in the business, they wanted something different for their Trudy. The unparalleled physical toll that wrestling takes is like one thing, but they also did not want her to be treated the way that women were treated in that time, and they were also worried about her body as a woman being, you know, hurt or whatever. But as a determined 12-year-old, Trudy made it very clear that she wanted to forge a path for women, and she wanted to change things for them. And even as she was so determined, her parents decided to try to enlist the help of her unofficial godfather, Andre the Giant, And they asked him to try to scare her out of a career in wrestling, and apparently he took her to Paris to do it, but it was just an exercise in futility at that point. A year or two later, when Paul worked for Vince McMahon Sr.'s Worldwide Wrestling Federation, WWF, Trudy was 13 or 14, and she would accompany her father to some of his wrestling matches. The two would get there early when the ring was empty and inescapably Paul would put his daughter through the paces. Eventually, some of the other wrestlers that were around would do the same, and with that same persistence that she had before, in 1978 at the age of 16, Trudy persuaded her family to send her to train with her Aunt Vivian and her then-husband, Buddy Wolf. Making another attempt to dissuade her further, The family asked Vivian to help them and make it fucking hurt. So she tried her best coaching coaching Trudy on a mattress in she and Buddy's home in Minnesota. She utilized a super rough style of training to make sure that Trudy was experiencing all this pain that was an inherent part of the sport and what her family wanted her to understand. But Vivian was unable to break Trudy down, and even after two months of being punched, thrown, and bruised on a mattress, it was the same. And after recognizing that this commitment was not to be wavered, or whatever, Paul sent his own daughter to the same place he sent his own sister, Columbia, South Carolina, to hone her skills with Lillian Ellison, or as everyone knew her, the fabulous moolah. The wrestler Janine Moseth, known as Mad Maxine, said when she met Trudy at Moolah's, she was struck by her beauty and angelic nature. She wasn't the only one that thought so, because at 16 years old, Trudy's cherubic face inspired so many people to tell her she would make the best baby face. And this did not go over well with Trudy, because she would scowl and Boyle, knowing her roots, and she knew that she felt an almost biological attraction to villainy. And at Moolah's, Trudy described almost army-like schedules with barracks around the property that housed the girls who trained there. Mad Maxine alleged that Moolah placed a type of veil of security around the girls to maintain their trust, but that this mothering was just a facade because she recalled how Moolah would take advantage of her trainee's reliance on her, 
Among other wrestlers like Sandy Parker, Wendy Richter, Susie Mae McCoy, and more, Trudy alleged that moolah would take about 25% of the girl's income. And this figure could vary depending on who was on her good side. And I know I've said this many different times throughout this podcast, but moolah is such a big part of women's wrestling history, and she is mentioned so much, so I feel like I'm just going to keep being a broken record about it, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but... I know I've said this before as well, but not only monetarily did she take advantage of these people, she also was wielding her power to take advantage of some of the girls sexually. The wrestler David Heath, also known as Gangrel, states in his Dark Side of the Ring interview, he was told that Mula would walk up to one of the girls and say something to them like, you're sleeping with me tonight, hun. And maybe some of these encounters were consensual, but... Queer women wrestlers such as Sandy Parker and Susan Green reported that while they trained with Moolah in the 1960s, she condemned their sexuality, but she would meanwhile be having sex with and abusing some of the girls. While at the training facility in 1978, Trudy was approached by Moolah, who told her she needed to take some new photographs of herself for promoters, and quote-unquote this guy out west was going to pay her $500 to take her picture. Some places report that this was like a cardiologist slash photographer. I've never heard of that collaboration before, unless you're like taking pictures of the heart. She was so young though, and Moolah sent her all the way to another state, far away and alone. And Mad Maxine says that Trudy was naive and she didn't know that she had to be cautious of people. Yet, Mula was the one who sent her there, and she was the one who put this 16-year-old girl in danger, because this cardiologist photographer tried to rape Trudy, and thanks to her strength and training, she was able to fight him off and run away, but this trauma, among other things, gave Mula a, str a stranglehold over Trudy, because Trudy was usually a mixture of brick wall confidence and fragile softness, and according to Gangrel, Trudy would become visibly uncomfortable, shaky, unsettled when Moolah would enter the room even years after her training. Despite the trauma, Trudy remained training with Moolah because she was unsure of any other option. If you wanted to be a successful woman wrestler, Moolah was like the only circus available at the time. Around this time of her training, Trudy met and married her first husband, Dan Hurd. They had two sons, Joshua in 1980 and Vincent, who they called Van, in 1982. Having finished her training at Moolah's, Trudy secretly made her way down to Florida to keep on honing her craft. And I say secretly because the Vichans didn't approve of Trudy training still at this time, and they didn't keep quiet about it. So Trudy didn't tell her family where she was, and as a result, they stopped talking to her for a period of time. And this later came out because the WWF was trying to find Trudy to sign her, and when they reached out to her family to ask for her whereabouts, they let them know, and they had to end up hiring a PI to find her. And they found her as a Floridian waitress and a training wrestler. In December of 1985, Trudy debuted as either Angel Vachon or Trudy Hurd at Championship Wrestling from Florida. As she got her footing in a character that felt right, she was cast as a reporter and she would be interviewing live wrestlers on television. Not live wrestlers on television, interviewing wrestlers on live television. Not yet with that signature mad doggy and voice, gravelly, aggressive. She asks questions kind of delicately with a soft lilt to her voice. And one of the wrestlers she worked with was Kevin Sullivan, whose character at the time was a demonic cult leader. Trudy very well understood her family destiny as a heel, so she never entertained the idea of being a babyface, a valet, or a reporter. It was the mid-80s, and women's wrestling was following a very conservative character format, quite an all-American, granola-type Starbucks. That's a Page 7 reference, if anyone listens to Page 7. 
In the face of this mundane femininity expected from lady wrestlers at the time, Trudy knew that she had to stand out from the others, and she knew she had to go in the opposite direction to create her own course. For Trudy, expanding her art of villainy became paramount. Because of her enchantment with the work, she wanted to join this fiendish faction of Kevin's. And with one slap to the face on live television, Kevin hypnotized Trudy in the storyline and indoctrinated her into his cult. Supposedly after this slap to indoctrinate her and the show was over for the night, Luna ran up to Kevin and pointed her finger in his face, screaming, That's all you got, pussy? I'm a Vashon. In Florida, this promotion was within the Bible Belt, and it had left a lot of room for hysteria when a publication ran the headline, The Devil is My Manager, because the Christian viewership did not, did not imagine this as a performance at all. They imagined it as very real. And these religious residents of Tampa became genuinely terrified of Kevin and showed up to championship wrestling from Florida events with batteries to throw at him because they saw him as like this harbinger of evil. He was like feeding off the steam and the heat that the satanic panic had generated throughout the 1980s and a moral panic that still continues to this day. With books like Michelle Remembers and the McMartin Preschool Trial, Kevin's heel work went beyond normal villainy. It was imbuing the religious communities and the social climates of the day with fear. And with this demonic cult by her side, Trudy began to curate the character and the look that she was going to maintain and expand upon for the rest of her career. She said about this time, quote, At the beginning, they wanted to call me Moaning Mona. But Nancy Sullivan, Kevin's wife at the time, said, I didn't look like the moaning type, so she proposed that I would be Luna, short for lunatic. It was actually Nancy who shaved my hair. She was one of the rare female friends I ever had, unquote. Nancy Sullivan was a valet known by many different names, Fallen Angel, Woman, Nancy Toffoloni, and Nancy Benoit. At this time with Luna, her persona was Fallen Angel, a big hair, brawn, panty-clad she-devil, and when Nancy shaved one side of the flowing blonde hair on Trudy's head, Luna became everlasting. She left her with a half-bald canvas, and Luna would draw a myriad of veins, differing shades of black, purple, blue, and pink. She adorned herself with silver chains, and she wore skin-tight black leather, latex, PVC-looking garments, and she would blame this veinous face makeup with dark eyes. It was beautiful and ghoulish. She was paying homage to her family through facets of her performance, and it was reminding fans of her deeply held roots in wrestling. Early on, she adopted that voice, like her uncle, the mad dog Maurice. I'm down and, and bleeding and begging for mercy. That's the way I like it. That's what's beautiful. I've been down before, but I've never been out. She was utilizing it even before she was anointed Luna, and Maurice would growl at his opponents and show them just how rabid he was, and Luna wanted to do the same. But in this, like, higher-pitched, growl she would do sounded even more unsettling than the one that Maurice would do. The pain, the pain, and the anguish, you're mine. But Luna was starting to cement herself in this beautiful company that meant so much to her and so much to her family. And despite this villainous character, Luna was so incredibly beautiful, and I feel like it's important to understand just how beautiful she was. She had penetrating almond eyes that were such a beautiful color. They were like greeny blue and really, really high cheekbones. And honestly, only a face as symmetrical as hers could still look ethereal with like half of her head shaved and veins cascading down her head and face. She, like, contorted herself into the heel she always wanted to be. She looked like a porcelain doll that a teenager took and made into, like, a punk 
metal teen dream. There would be no more questions about her being a babyface now. Because with Luna, Trudy found the person with whom she identified with the most, the person that she always felt she was. And she carried her character into every facet of her life, and it didn't end once the cameras were cut and the ring was deconstructed. Her son Van said that she was always Luna, and that's it, it, she was that, and she would always be that to him. Okay. I've never done this before, but I think I might call it here. This is going to be the end of part one. And I will pick back up in the next couple of weeks and bring you part two of when Luna's career really starts to pick up and take off and the end of her life. If you're still listening, I want to say thank you so much Queen of the Ring was written by me, Alexa Pruitt, and the music is by Kreider Dane of Helter Skelter Music Productions. If you like what you hear, join us again. (laughs) 